what is considered to be ominous, but particularly when seen in the mediastinal window, window is basically uh, 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 this kind of a projection from the uh, from from the from uh, from the tumor, which is considered to be uh, uh, ominous and uh, and and uh, possibly visceral pleural invasion, because if this tumor is less than three centimeters and has something like this, this will upstage the tumor to a T2 disease. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. And if you see something like this, you need to approach a radiologist to help you understand whether there is evidence of uh, pleural invasion or not, because some of these tumors would be coming up to you for SVRT and this would have prognostic implications. Uh, coming to the staging uh, back again, I mentioned earlier that invasion of the diaphragm is T4 disease. This is a tumor where the diaphragm is infiltrated and this would be considered as T4, initially considered as T3 disease. And a single uh, extrathoracic site is considered as M1B and multiple extrathoracic sites has been uh, as usual con considered as M1C. Uh, coming to the lymph node involvement, if there is uh, involvement, the lymph node involvement has not been changed particularly. Involvement of ipsilateral hyalur or uh, uh, interlobar group of lymph nodes is considered as N1. Again, the mediastinal lymph nodes, uh, the involvement of the mediastinal lymph nodes is considered as N2 or N3, depending upon whether it is ipsilateral or contralateral. The ipsilateral, paratracheal, and the sub disease, whereas the contralateral hyalur uh, or the mediastinal lymph nodes or the involvement of the supraclavicular fossa is considered as N3 disease. Uh, and you need to understand as to how these mediastinal uh, lymph node groups are situated and uh, what is the classification system that is used for this me mediastinal nodes. How do you, uh, which group of lymph nodes would you call as ipsilateral? How do you classify as contralateral disease? So this is a, this is a, a classification system. Initially, the classification system for the lymph nodes was, was, was given by the Naruke system by the Japanese sometimes in, sometime in 98 and the American Thoracic Society had their own system of uh, lymph node classification and then the mountain Dressler uh, uh, modification came sometime in 2005 but still there were discrepancies between the Japanese and the American system of classification and finally in 2008 the uh, lung cancer staging project by the International Association of Study uh, for a Lung Cancer Group. Uh, they integrated both the Japanese and the uh, American system of lymph node classification to come up with this IALSC uh, classification system, uh, which was introduced in 2007. According to this uh, 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 classification, the lymph nodal levels are classified into different zones. So uh, this is the supraclavicular zone is it lies between the precoid and the supra uh, and the clavicle region, and uh, uh, then you have the superior mediastinal lymph nodes, which include the level two, the level three, and level four. And I will come later as to how these levels are classified. The upper paratracheal group of lymph nodes, uh, which are around the trachea, are uh, called as upper uh, are, are level two. The lower paratracheal group of lymph nodes are level four. Uh, the, the group of lymph nodes which are uh, uh, surrounding the vessels are the prevascular and the retrotracheal group of lymph nodes. And uh, level seven is the subcarinal group of lymph nodes. Uh, and finally, you have the paraesophageal group of lymph nodes along the esophagus and the pulmonary ligament group of lymph nodes. These are the various mediastinal groups. And finally, you have a group of uh, nodes which are located along the hilum, the interlobar, lobar, and subsegmental regions. All these uh, group of lymph nodes uh, classify as N1 disease, but, uh, uh, if the tumor is located in the ipsilateral lobe. 
again uh, uh, how do you define as to whether the lymph node station is ipsilateral or contralateral and it's, this is a very uh, very uh, good pictorial diagram so if you have a tumor which is located in the right lower lobe of the lung and you have lymph nodes which are in the hilum or located along the bronchus region in the same side of uh, along the same side of the uh, uh, lung, then it is classified as N1 disease. So level 10 and level 11 would classify as N1. Now for the mediastinal group, the, the dividing line is basically the left side of the trachea to be considered it as ipsilateral. So any lymph nodes which are for the right-sided lung cancer, which are lying to the right side uh, 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 to the, uh, the the left side the entire right side of the trachea uh, including the left border of the trachea that is considered as level 2 and uh, uh, the 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 the, mid, the dividing line is on the uh, left side of the trachea then again level 7 which is a midline group of lymph nodes irrespective of whether the tumor is on the right side or the le left side, they will always be considered as N2 uh, uh, disease. And again, for the lower esophageal group of lymph nodes, the line passes along the midline of the esophagus. So anything to the right of the esophagus for this tumor would be uh, N2 disease. Anything to the left of the midline of the esophagus would be N3 disease. Uh, so this is how, how the lines are uh, there for classifying the lymph nodes as ipsilateral uh, or contralateral mediastinal lymph nodes. So ipsilateral, which is this uh, orange group, is considered as N2 and contralateral, uh, here the yellow group is considered as N3 for a right-sided tumor. But for the left-sided tumor, all these yellow would be considered as N2 and everything which is in orange would be considered as N3 disease. So uh, again, this is, this is again a very uh, nice classification of the different uh, lymph nodal groups. So, and they have defined different anatomical levels as to how you define the lymph node regions. So the level one lymph node uh, basically extends from the cricoid cartilage to the upper part of the manubrium sterni or the lower part of the uh, clavicle. The level two group of lymph nodes uh, differ as to on the right side and the left side. And then you can see the line. The line is on the uh, left lateral border of the trachea uh, for considered uh, for it to be considered as right as left or right or left so the level two on the right side the upper border is again the manu manubrium and the lower border of the level two uh, group of lymph nodes is uh, basically where the uh, uh, brachiocephalic this is the left brachiocephalic uh, way where it crosses the trachea so that particular region forms the uh, upper boundary of the level four right side lymph node so that's the upper boundary and the lower border of the level four right side is the lower border of the azygous vein for the level two on the left side it's the upper border of the clavicle the lower border is the upper part of uh, the aorta for the level four or it is uh, the, the level four uh, on the left side lie between the upper and the lower part of the aortic arch. And then there is a level uh, five group of lymph nodes which lie between the vessels. That's the aorta and the main pulmonary artery. So between these two levels lie the level five group of lymph nodes. Uh, level seven, again, from uh, the carina, to on the right side, the level seven, which is the subcarinal group of lymph node, which is a midline lymph node. It is always considered as N2, irrespective of the right or the left side. So on the right side, the level seven group of lymph node extends from the carina to the, uh, the bronchus intermediate. Uh, uh, this is the bronchus intermediate. That's the upper lobe bronchus. That is the bronchus intermediate. And this is the lower lobe bronchus. So basically where the bronchus intermediate 
starts to divide into the lower and the middle lobe bronchus that is the uh, 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 that's the that's the site where you stop for the level 7 group of lymph node and for uh, the the uh, on the uh, right, uh, left hand side it's basically the division of the main bronchus into the upper bronchus and the lower bronchus so that's the site uh, where of lymph nodes again this is uh, this is a, a, a societal view basically again talking about the same levels the level 1 is from the cricoid to the manubrium on the left side the level 2 is from the manubrium to the upper part of the aortic arch on the left side the level 6 is anterior to the aorta uh, uh, at the level of the aortic arch the level 4 on the left side is the upper part of the aortic arch to the lower part of the aortic arch and between the aortic arch and the mid, uh, main pulmonary artery you have the level 5 group of lymph nodes and on the left side the level 7 uh, extends from the tracheal bifurcation at the level of carina to the left lower low bronchus similarly on the right side the level uh, the up the level 1 is from cricoid to manubrium not very different from the left side the the uh, level 2 is from the manubrium to the upper uh, where uh, on the right side it's basically where the brachiocephalic vein crosses the trachea and the level 4 is from the crossing of the brachiocephalic vein to the isigus vein lower down so uh, uh this is a atlas which basically uh, also discusses this different uh, lymph nodes uh, levels on uh, axial um, uh, ct slices and i would urge you people to go through this atlas uh, which would uh, help you in delineating these stations when required Uh, another thing about the staging system is uh, as of now it does not take into account uh, the number of lymph nodes uh, but what has been suggested in the recent staging system is uh, that in the near future probably they will also take into account the number of lymph nodes uh, and they are collecting information and on this as well so for a single station n1 is uh, a single station lymph node uh in the ipsilateral lung is would be considered as n1a multiple stations the uh, parenchyma of the lung would be considered as n1b uh, n2a is again a single station uh, lymph node uh, in the mediastinum uh, without uh, without I mean, having again uh, without having any uh, uh, hyalur uh, metastases n2a2 is a single station n2 uh, with n1 disease so without with skip metastases is uh, classified as n2a1 and without skip metastases is classified as n2a2 and multiple station n2 uh, would be classified as n2b uh, it is important to keep this in mind because uh, when we are deciding uh, whether to take a patient for uh, radiation or send a patient for surgery particularly in the case of n2 uh, this particular classification uh, helps us because possibly a single station n2 uh, with a operable primary in the lung uh, would uh, would would be considered for surgery as well uh the current classification system does not include this it just classifies the mediastinal lymph nodes into n1 n2 and n3 n1 is the hyalur n2 mediastinum and n3 is contralateral mediastinum and the supraclavicular group of lymph nodes but they they are collecting information on this and possibly in the future you might have a classification based on this single station versus multi station n2 so uh we're coming to the stage uh, group and what actually constitutes a locally advanced lung cancer so any n2 disease irrespective of uh, the moment it is n2 it uh, it goes into a uh, stage 3 lung cancer and uh, the division into a b and c will depend upon the primary so a resectable that is a t1 t2 and that is a resectable uh, uh, tumor with n2 disease is classified as uh, uh, 
uh, is classified as 3A. Similarly, you have uh, T3 with N1, which is potentially resectable, also classified as 3A, but uh, and a T4 disease, uh, which, which may or may not be resectable with N0 and N1 disease classified as 3A. So, I mean, there's a huge heterogeneity in the 3A that you see. You have a small primary with mediastinal lymph nodes. You have a large primary with small lymph nodes. So it's a heterogeneous disease that is what I'm getting at. And the moment it is the primary is large, as well as the mediastinal lymph nodes are large, it goes as 3B and N3 disease uh, obviously classifies as 3D, 3C disease. So this is again uh, uh, the staging classification uh, as per the current uh, uh, staging uh, uh, eighth uh, staging system, and it beautifully uh, separates out the various groups, uh, and it works well in terms of prognostically separating out these different groups. What is uh, interesting to see is that there is not much of a difference between this uh, 3C and 4A. But when you look at the uh, survivals, uh, the uh, two-year survivals, uh, they, are, they are really not very different. And possibly in the future, uh, we might have uh, some modification in these two groups as well. So uh, I spoke uh, about earlier that 3A is a very heterogeneous disease. I mean, it comes to you for CTRT, but it can be a small tumor. A T4 disease is something which is invading the diaphragm, something located lower down, uh, which would require a separate kind of a management strategy as compared to something, some uh, a, a tumor which is located in the, uh, which is a tumor, a T1 tumor and multiple lymph nodes in the mediastinum. So it's a very heterogeneous disease. And uh, I mean, the, the management can also differ uh, widely for this heterogeneous uh, population. So coming to the staging, uh, the utility of uh, PET-CT in lung cancer, we all know, I need not emphasize that it is used for staging. And uh, PET-CT is important for us because it also is used for planning radiotherapy. And uh, for lung cancer staging, the, the, the sensitivity and the specificity of uh, PET-CT is much higher than that of a CT. And what PET-CT helps is, in, it also helps in preventing futile thoracotomies. Uh, PET-CT in general, the rule of thumb, it, uh, upstages the disease in about 15 to 20% of the cases. So when we talk about stage three lung cancer, and I told you how heterogeneous it is a group, stage three A itself is very heterogeneous. It has an operable, a potentially operable and an inoperable group, and as well as uh, stage three B and C, uh, which are potentially unresectable. And chemo radiotherapy, then multiple trials and multiple guidelines, when you go into the guidelines, they would suggest that chemo radiotherapy is, uh, is the standard of care, but there are select subgroups where surgery can be considered as an option. Uh, concurrent chemo radiation is superior to sequential administration. Uh, we have the meta-analysis from Operin, and I'll be discussing a bit about this. And uh, the, the best median survival with CTRT was seen in the RTOG 0617 trial, wherein the 60 gray with the 60 gray arm and contemporary RT approaches where they had used PET CT, where they had used IMRT in a good proportion of patients, the median survival is to the tune of 28 months. And what is also important to understand is one out of four uh, uh, patients would uh, still fail locally. So when we look at the results of S, uh, CTRT for potentially uh, resectable disease, and this is the pre-PET era, the, the, the median survival uh, was ranging between 22 to 23 months, irrespective of whether you add or do not add surgery. And for inoperable disease uh, with contemporary trials that we have, the median survival is to the tune of 27 to 28 months. Not that this group is doing better than this. It's because that uh, these are recent trials. They have used 
pet CT and possibly there is a stage migration. That's why also the survivals are better. So coming to the management and these are the ESMO guidelines. So if you have a N0, N1 disease and a resectable primary, uh, then the patient goes for surgery. And uh, if on surgery, there is an unforeseen N2, the patient comes to you for adjuvant chemotherapy and possibly adjuvant radiotherapy. For N2 disease, now that's a big challenge. If it is a potentially resectable N2, you have a small primary T1, T2, you have a single station N2, and the patient is fit, this calls for a multidisciplinary discussion. And depending upon the MDT, the patient can very well go for surgery followed by post-operative RT or if there are factors, for example, there are a lot of comorbidities, the patient is not going to tolerate a lobectomy or there is a requirement of numenectomy in these patients that calls for a non-surgical approach primarily treated with CTRT. So it's, it's not very straightforward that all three A's, uh, you just do CTRT. Uh, for these three A's, you have to individually see as to what is the status of primary, what is the status of lymph nodes, whether they are resectable or, or not resectable, what is the general condition of the patient, what surgery would be required for the patient, whether it is a lobectomy or pneumonectomy, and all these factors are taken into account for taking a decision. So it's ultimately the, uh, the, the expertise of the multidisciplinary team. And why there is so much of debate uh, as to whether surgery be, should be used or not used in stage three lung cancer is based on the trial published quite some time back, a decade ago by Kathy Albain, who randomized patients into concurrent CTRT versus new adjuvant CRT followed by surgery. And what this trial showed was that there is a difference in the progression-free survival with the addition of surgery, but there is no difference in overall survival. And this is the trial that most of them would quote for using CTRT in stage three disease. But uh, unplanned subgroup analysis also showed that for patients who underwent lobectomy versus patients who underwent luminectomy, the outcomes were significantly different. So for patients who undergo lobectomy, the outcomes, the median survivals are to the range of 34 months with the addition of surgery as compared to the ones who had pneumonectomy. So if a patient comes to you in the clinic, has a primary which is resectable, has N2 disease which is potentially resectable, single station, the primary is not extending into the central structure so that the patient will require pneumonectomy. This calls for an MDT and uh, possibly surgery versus radiotherapy, depending upon patient preferences and the surgical expertise available at your center. Coming to concurrent chemoradiotherapy and the, uh, why not sequential and concurrent, the reason is this meta-analysis, which suggested that there is a benefit in that there's a benefit in overall survival of five percent uh, at three years. But when you look into the uh, median survival benefit, this five percent overall survival benefit translates into a three months overall survival benefits. So it's a three month difference between concurrent CTRT versus sequential CTRT. And remember, this comes at a cost and the cost is increased in the toxicity, primarily esophageal toxicity and to a certain extent, pneumonitis. But primarily it is esophageal toxicity. So you have to look at your patient. What is the performance of the patient? And if you think that the patient has borderline performance, has a large mass, I think a safer approach would be to go for a sequential approach rather than jump into the bad bandwagon of doing concurrent CTRT. Uh, just to quote, uh, there was a Dutch analysis, population-based analysis from the Dutch group, wherein they showed that for the patients, the routine patients that, they pre that present to them in the clinic, the locally advanced, only 50% of them are eligible for concurrent CTRT approaches. And the numbers, would be much lower 
for us in the Indian setting. Another point worth noting is that we, uh, all of us have graduated to cisplatin and paclitaxel, and there was a phase, phase two trial which suggested that cisplatin paclitaxel has, uh, has uh, inferior OS as compa compared to uh, cisplatin etoposide. This is a systematic review which suggests that probably both these regimens given concurrently with radiotherapy uh, have uh, the same outcome. But what is different is the toxicity, so that should be kept in mind. The addition of etoposide does increase the incidence of thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, nausea, and vomiting. So you have to be careful when you are adding uh, one drug versus the other. Another important point worth noting is the incidence of pneumonitis. Does it, does it increase with your concurrent agents? And this very interesting analysis gave, uh, came out in 2012 by David Palmer's group from London, Ontario, which suggested that the addition of taxane uh, on a multivariate modeling, the, uh, it showed that addition of taxanes does lead to increased risk of pneumonitis. So when you're using taxane-based chemoradiotherapy, you have to be a little bit cautious uh, in, in, in your dose volume parameters. One of the previous institutions that I worked, uh, instead of accepting a V20 of generally 35%, for somebody whom we are giving uh, taxanes, we would, we would uh, generally uh, keep it on the lower side of uh, 30%. So these are the things that you need to keep in mind uh, when you're planning a patient for, for uh, chemoradiotherapy. Coming to target delineation uh, lung, and uh, I know that a lot of uh, you are working in a COBOL setup, and uh, you might wonder that does it really make a difference? And uh, uh, the, the problem with 2D approaches is it's very difficult to uh, visu visualize the tumor, and uh, uh, I mean, unless and until you don't see the tumor, you can't hit it better. Plus, it comes at a risk of increased toxicity. And there is good uh, outcome data available to us, which clearly shows that the use of CT simulation and the use of conformal techniques uh, has a it has an implication on, on, has a bearing on survival. So use of CT simulation based planning and use of uh, conformal radiotherapy improves survival in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, coming to the role of IMRT, and uh, this, this issue is particularly not very well settled uh, in literature. This is an analysis of the RTOG 0617 trial, wherein a proportion about 40 to 50% of the patients did receive uh, IMRT. And what this trial did suggest was that the incidence of pneumonitis was slightly lower, but this is a post-hoc analysis. So, uh, so we have to be careful with the interpretation of such data and the outcomes were not significantly different whether you use 3CRT or IMRT. So with the recent trials, the toxicity that we, uh, that we the, the older trials, the toxicity that we used to see with the uh, 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 co concurrent chemoradiation was uh, grade three or more pneumonitis was to the tune of 15 to 30%. And esophagitis, grade three, grade four esophagitis was to the tune of 20 to 30%. But with the current trials, uh, the 061 is the dose escalation trial, Proclaim is used uh, cisplatin etoposide versus cisplatin and pemetrexid. And uh, this, the third trial is basically use of consolidation, cisplatin and docetaxel in locally advanced lung cancer. All these trials using contemporary radiotherapy techniques do show that possibly the risk of pneumonitis and esophagitis are lower than what was seen about 10 years ago. Uh, a very important thing that need, needs to be kept in mind when you are there in the clinic and uh, uh, for uh, if you, you have taken a decision that, okay, this patient requires concurrent CTRT, uh, you need to make sure that you initiate treatment early. This is a very good analysis which did suggest that if there is a delay in treatment of more than four weeks, about 10 to 15 percent of the patients would have uh, progression uh, in the second scan that you do. So what the guidelines recommend is start treatment early, preferably within three weeks of your uh, seeing the patient uh, uh, in your uh, entities. 
Uh, another thing that you need to keep in mind that as I told the tumor size is a very important prognostic factor. This very interesting analysis came which showed that uh, the presence of N3 disease, that is the contralateral mediastinal lymph nodes or the supraclavicular group of lymph nodes was not such a bad prognostic factor as was the uh, volume of disease more than 700 cc. So if you have a patient uh, who has multiple comorbidities, uh, has a large volume lung disease, and uh, don't be overzealous in going ahead uh, with uh, radical CTRT. Uh, other options of shortened course of radiotherapy can also be considered. Uh, one more concept that is very important is elective nodal radiation. And clearly, we have trials, a phase three randomized trial by, the, uh, by D. Rashikar, which used PET CT as a staging and excluded the lymph nodes based on the PET CT data. And what this trial clearly showed that elective nodal radiation is not necessary and it does increase to toxicity. But also, it is important to remember when you're removing uh, the, the treatment of nodes electively, you have to be very careful as to what you are including. Otherwise, uh, if there are errors in contouring, uh, you will be missing out on targets. So and, uh, for surgical patients, uh, how do they assess the uh, mediastinum? For whenever a patient goes for uh, surgery and a PET CT is done, irrespective of whether the PET CT is negative or positive, the patient will go for some kind of a mediastinal staging. And the mediastinal staging is either invasive or non invasive. The invasive staging is basically uh, the, the mediastinoscopy, and the non invasive staging are the EBUS or the EUS. And uh, the basically just for the benefit of uh, the residents who are over here, the EBUS uh, is, uh, you have a probe in the bronchus. So basically it's able to target nodes along the bronchus. Uh, so all these level 10, level four, the, the, para, uh, the, uh, the nodes which are located around the trachea, can be easily sampled by the uh, EBUS, but, uh, the nodes which are located along the esophagus, that is the level 8 and the level 9 lymph node, they are better sampled on the EOS. So they are kind of complementary. And when they are doing a sampling, it's a systematic sampling that they do. The systematic sampling is that they will at least, at least they will, uh, they will, uh, they will, uh, they will try and uh, they will assess the lymph nodes in the subcarinal region. That's the level seven lymph node and the level four R and the four L group of lymph nodes. So these are the lymph node stations that they will always assess besides other lymph nodes which are positive or negative on a PET. Uh, so for us as radiation oncologists, we do not go for a invasive mediastinal staging. And what we have to rely on is the PET CT. The specificity of the PET scan for detecting mediastinal group of lymph nodes. So the sensitivity is uh, slightly lower, but it is highly specific. And mind you, this is data from the Western world. The PET scores from the CT scan is because the PET is able to detect uh, disease in subcentimeter lymph nodes. And the CT scan basically relies on the size criteria. That's the difference. But what in the Indian context, and this uh, data is very interesting, which shows that for mediastinal staging in the Indian context, the positive predictive value of uh, a PET CT is down to 40, 45 to 50%. That means that if you stage the patient, you see mediastinal lymph nodes on the PET CT scan, half the times you will be wrong and only half the times you'll be correct. So that's something that you have to keep in mind as a radiation oncology uh, oncologist. You, everything that lights up on the PET CT is not disease uh, because we have a lot of granulomatous inflammation in the subgroup of patients. You need to have, again, a good discussion with the radiologist, the PET radiologist, as to what are these lymph nodes, whether they are uh, inflammatory, or whether they look to be diseased. 
And in the Western countries, uh, what they have suggested is that uh, possibly that if you add a e-bus to a pet, you will increase the possibility of uh, 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 you will uh, increase the negative predictive value basically. But what they also suggest that irrespective that uh, you have on CT scan, you have an enlarged node and normal size node, and uh, if there is an enlarged node on a CT scan and uh, uh, or a normal size lymph node on a CT scan and the node is PET positive, the chances of the node having disease is to the tune of 70 to 75 percent. So you will include these lymph nodes irrespective whether they are EBUS negative or positive in your target volumes. Now this is Western data. For your setup, you have to discuss it with the radiologist whether these nodes are inflammatory or not. And for the PET negative lymph node, irrespective of whether the nodes are enlarged or non-enlarged, you can, it's a value judgment. So the chances that you might miss out a node uh, if you exclude these regions is somewhere to the range of six to 13%. So that's what the data that we have from the Western countries. Unfortunately, we don't have this kind of data for, 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 uh, uh, from the Indian uh, countries as of now. Now coming to the doses of CTRT, 60 gray and 30 fractions in the stand, is the standard. The RTOG 0617 trial clearly showed that uh, dose escalation is, uh, is not beneficial. Not only it is not beneficial, it was in fact inferior to the standard doses. The reasons are not known. Cardiac toxicity is one of the factors which has been quoted uh, as uh, a reason for these, uh, uh, these, these very, uh, uh, I mean, strange results of this trial. Now, again, what factors else when the patient comes to you in the clinic? What are the factors which would predict that this patient would have a light, high likelihood of developing pneumonitis? And when you're selecting a patient for CDRT, uh, I hope in the clinic you are doing your pulmonary function tests. And the recommendations in most of the guidelines is to have an AVV1 or a DLCO of 50%. Uh, in absolute terms, it is AVV1 of 1.2 liters. Some of them accept up to one liters. But what is also very intriguing, intriguing to see is that if there is a coexisting interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, the chances the patient will have grade three uh, pneumonitis is very high. So you have to be very careful in these patients. If they have a large volume disease and has interstitial lung disease, again, you have to be careful with your planning. Plus the fact that would you really want to give radical doses of CTRT or just give some kind of uh, palliative doses in 30 and 10 or 39 and 13. Coexisting co uh, COPD, it, although, Initially, it was thought to be a risk factor, but uh, the recent trials do not consider it to be a very serious uh, uh, risk factor. Another very interesting analysis that came from Dr. Senan's group from the UMC was that uh, the presence of tumor cavitation. And uh, the, it, particularly the squamous cell carcinoma, they are centrally located and they have tumor cavitation. The, the incidence of developing pulmonary toxicity was 50%. So again, you have to be very careful with these group of patients uh, uh, and uh, at least explain the risks when they come to you in the clinic. And of course, uh, the third factor has already been discussed is the use of concurrent taxings. So uh, again, getting back to concurrent CTRT again, uh, we look at trials and these trials are done in very controlled settings. Just to let you know that uh, the patients that the routine patients that come to you in the clinic actually might not even represent in those trials because they are elderly, they have very borderline performance status, the FEV1 and DLCO might be suboptimal. Only 3% of the patients in trials were performance score of two. And in our clinic, you would see about 20 to 30% with a performance of scope for two less than 16% were more than 70 years, and all of them had FEV1 or DLC of at least 50%. And when, when you do, when you practice the clinic, you might see FEV1 and DLC going down to 40% 40, 40%, uh, very commonly. And most of these patients did not have 
comorbidities. They were very fit patients who were taken in these trials. And that's the reason you see that kind of results, that is median survival of 28 months. I mean, you have to assess your patient in your setting, see all the factors, and that is how you need to estimate uh, their survival, if at all. You just can't quote that, okay, uh, the 061 trial gave concurrent CTRT and the median survival is 28 months, which might just not be applicable to your patient, which is standing in front of you in the clinic. Uh, so these are the important uh, selection criteria. Look at comorbidities, lung function, uh, performance status, age also you have to look into because myelosuppression, uh, the, the incidence of myelosuppression is more in uh, uh, elderly patients, the, uh, the tumor volume, and when you do a planning, what are the dose uh, uh, that are achievable to the normal tissues? So basically, a person for CTRT is somebody who, with a good performance, with reasonable lung function, with no major comorbidities, wherein you are able to produce a good plan with acceptable normal tissue doses. Uh, patient positioning and all of you might be very worse with it, not different from very uh, other sites, important is that it has to be comfortable, and because it is comfortable, it is always going to be reproducible. Uh, both arms overhead, uh, generally a T bar or a wing board. A wing board is a preferred because it uh, gives uh, gives uh, uh, this thing uh, support to the arm, and it's more comfortable to the patient. Greater choice of it also when you have arms overhead, it allows for greater choice of beam access. Uh, use of uh, immobilization casts have not to show of any further benefit over a wing board or a T-bar. And if you combine it with a knee rest, this patient uh, position is generally very comfortable. And because it is comfortable, it is reproducible. So when you do a planning scan, the, you have to make sure that the entire lungs have to be included in the planning scan. So it's from the cricoid cartilage to the L2 vertebra use intravenous contrast which can improve the delineation especially for centrally located primary tumors for a peripherally located tumor it the intravenous contrast which is surrounded by lung parenchyma it might not be helpful but for a centrally located tumor it makes a difference plus the mediastinal lymph nodes are better visualized when you give iv contrast uh, CT slices of 2 to 3 millimeter, not only to construct a good DRR, but also it helps in better visualization of the uh, mediastinal group of lymph nodes. So that's what the contrast does. It helps outline uh, the, your mediastinal uh, primary, uh, mediastinal group of lymph nodes better, as well as a primary which is uh, located centrally. Uh, and uh, what is also important is to incorporate motion in some way or the other. And uh, one of uh, the, the, the basic, uh, one of the very common, a lot of you might not be having uh, uh, motion uh, assessment scans, for example, a 4D CT scan in your setting. Uh, fluoroscopy is, is uh, one of the methods uh, which has been traditionally used, uh, but uh, you have to be mindful that whatever motion that you assess on a fluoroscopy might give you some degree of assessment in the superior, inferior, and the medial lateral uh, direction, but not in all uh, uh, dimensions. So even when you assess a motion, you uh, suppose you assess with a the fluoroscopy, there is a five millimeter motion, uh, you might need to give uh, still larger PTV margins. Uh, if, if you use that as a motion assessment strategy. The other thing that is very commonly, uh, uh, was commonly done in the past is the use of a CT, slow CT scan. So what is a slow CT scan? A slow CT scan is that at one table position, uh, the acquisition of the scan at a particular table position is slow. So because it acquires at one table position, it takes four seconds to acquire scan at that particular table position, the entire breathing cycle is captured at that position. And because the entire breathing cycle is captured, you are invariably going to capture the motion trajectory of the tumor. But the problem with su such scans is there are a lot of artifacts. So the accuracy of delineation in such scans uh, might again be compromised. 
Something that is uh, commonly used and now increasingly available in most of the centers is the use of 4DCT. It is also known as respiratory correlated motion that we are trying to incorporate in the target volumes as well as uh, organ at risk. And uh, one thing you need to remember, there are studies which have shown that the target volume and the mediastinal lymph nodes might actually move differently. So what the 4DCT helps you, it, is, it helps you to individually assess the motion of the target volume, volume as well as the mediastinal hook of lymph nodes. So this is a 4D acquisition where you have a, where you have a marker uh, with infrared uh, and this is a camera which captures the respiratory waveform. And this respiratory waveform is then divided into different phases. And then there is, uh, at, at a particular couch position, you have multiple scans. And uh, these scans are then binned into different phases. And that is how they are sorted out. So at a particular uh, couch position, you acquire a scan, sorry, at a particular couch position, you acquire a scan, multiple scans, and uh, these multiple scans you get and then sort it out into different phases. Uh, one thing, again, that needs to be uh, kept in mind when you're using 4D CT is uh, uh, you have to see how well it works, plus uh, the phase errors. The, if you have a regular respiration, the, the sorting program works very well. But if you have an irregular respiration, the binning or the sorting might not work very well. And there might be errors, and these are called as phase errors. At least on a G4 ECT scanner, you are able to see the, you are able to quantify the, the errors. And generally what is recommended is that these phase errors, uh, if they are more than 10%, your sorting is very in inaccurate. So that's something that you need to uh, discuss with your physics team. The second thing is that the breathing cycle. So breathing cycle is between two inspiration or two expiration, crest or trough. That's the breathing cycle. So generally for your 4D to be able to sort this nicely into different uh, phases, generally 10 phases is what the sorting is done. Uh, the breathing cycle, the minimum breathing cycle that is recommended, like at least it should be 3.5 seconds. If it is less than 3.5 seconds, again, the sorting, there is an issue in the sorting. And then you have these different kind of imaging sets that you get from the 4DCT. The first one is the maximum intensity projection, uh, which is basically generated by a software. It's nothing that you do. It is generated by a software. What is does, what this uh, maximum intensity projection does, it, image is basically, it traces the pixel value. So the lung uh, tumor, if you uh, take it in a lung uh, window, it is bright as compared to the parenchyma. So it traces the pixel value in all these phases. And then it integrates this pixel value. Uh, and that is how it basically generates the image. And this is basically the trajectory of the motion, a uh, trajectory of the tumor in the entire uh, breathing cycle uh, of the patient. Uh, MINIP is basically a kind of an intersection where uh, the tumor is going to be present always. So this is kind of union where the tumor is going to be present in different phases, it unifies. And MINIP is an uh, intersection and something which is now very commonly used is mean position position so mean position uh, uh, there are two kind of mean position scans that we use one is the mid ventilation scan and the mid position scan so mid ventilation scan is the it's a time weighted uh, geometric center of the uh, motion so as you see over here in this image the maximum time that the tumor is going to spend is around this location and at the extremes the chance that the tumor is going to be uh, located here is less so that is what a mid ventilation or a mid position scan is all about it's a time weighted average that is uh, generated by the system 
So just uh, about the 3D uh, conventional CT image, you have, uh, it's a snapshot. Uh, so you might uh, not uh, uh, basically uh, 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 be able to assess the motion. Here, because uh, you're tracking, the mo you are able to assess the motion of the target uh, through its entire trajectory. Uh, a limitation of the MIP is because now it, it, it basically uh, tracks the intensity. And when there is, uh, when there is a similar intensity adjacent to it, for example, this lower load tuber, now there is diaphragm and the intensity, it is not able to track the motion of the tumor inferiorly because you have a diaphragm there and the intensity there is uh, overlapping with the structures below. Similarly, if you have this tumor close to the mediastinum, the MIP image might not be very uh, accurate in actually assessing the trajectory of the motion. So that's, these are the things that you need to also keep in mind when, I, when you're using these image sets for motion uh, uh, assessment. Uh, PET-CT again, uh, very commonly used uh, in treatment planning for lung cancers. What is important is that the, the acquisition of the PET has to be very uh, standardized and a very strict protocol has to be there in terms of attenuation correction, what kind of reconstruction, what windowing on the PET that you're using, all these things have to be standardized. And uh, uh, what does a PET-CT do? It helps us in identifying the lymph nodes. What over and above the CT scan, for the tumor, the PET-CT might not be very advantageous except in one situation. It is very advantageous in helping us identify the mediastinal group of lymph nodes which may or may not be picked up on a CT. So that is what PET-CT helps us in. But again, you have to keep in mind that tuberculosis is rampant and all PET-positive nodes, they have to be taken or not taken into your target, has to be individually discussed with the radiologist. The second uh, thing that PET helps us with is distinguishing the tumor from atelectasis. And I'll show you an example. And because of these factors, it helps in decreasing the inter observer variability in, uh, in delineation. And no method of PET CT is, uh, there are a lot of automatic contouring methods which are available with the PET CT, uh, PET -CT uh, scanners. And uh, you have thresholding, you have uh, absolute SUVs, but none of these methods of uh, automatic contouring, 2.5 times SUV you use and delineate the target or 40% of the maximum up, uh, of the SUP, SUV that you take as a target, none of these methods are considered to be very reliable. So you have to be careful. And the best way to integrate your pet city in your planning is to go for an intelligent contour. That is that you have a CT scan and you have a pet acquisition and you see both images side by side, you see where are the PET uptake areas, especially in the region of the mediastinum, and that region on the CT scan, uh, particularly the mediastinal uh, lymph node region, that should be included. Uh, and again, uh, caveat is that uh, inflammation or infection can influence PET uptake. So this is a CT scan of a lady with a central lung tumor and collapse of the lung. And it was very difficult to identify as to where the tumor is and where is the uh, collapsed lung. And the PET CT very, uh, very, very nicely uh, uh, basically uh, helps us determine as to where the tumor is located. And this is one situation where PET CTs are generally very useful. Uh, another uh, thing about these kind of tumors that we see in the clinic is if suppose a patient presents with you with a collapsed lung, right? And you start your radiation, you start your 3D, 3D CRT. It's very important that po possibly this might, uh, these kind of patients might require a replanning because when, uh, yes, for example, at 20 to 30 gray of radiation, uh, these uh, tumors might regress. And because there is a regression in the tumor, the lung opens up. And because the lungs open up, there is an entire mediastinal shift. So in that case, you might require a 
replanning. So these things have to be kept in mind. Some, somebody who's coming with atelectasis, you have to keep in mind that there might be opening up of the lung and uh, you might require a mid uh, planning scan again. Uh, so again, these are the limiting factors of the PET. The resolution of a PET CT is lower as compared to that of the CT scanner. All of you should know that. And uh, if you try to register PET and CT, many times the error of registration, uh, then your accuracy of uh, delineation with the help of PET. So that has to be kept in mind. And again, this thresholding and automatic contourings, uh, they have, uh, uh, they have, uh, they have been used in trials, but not routinely in clinics. So the best is to use it as a complementary tool, as an intelligent control, keep the images side by side and see which regions are taking up a pet and include that region. Uh, see that region on the CT scan and include that region of the uh, lymph nodes on the CT scan. So coming to the delineating uh, G GTV, so you have to review all imaging, review your bronchoscopy findings, particularly for centrally located lung tumors. And uh, when you contour your GTV uh, for a lung cancer, there are recommended windowing and uh, 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 window levels and width that has to be kept in mind. So for, for the lung window, the best concordance is uh, the width of 1600 level of minus 600 for parenchyma. And for the mediastinal window, these are the window and level. Because depending upon your windowing, your size of the tumor will change. And when you are, uh, when you need to make sure that you have to have a protocol in your department, that these are the window levels and width that you're going to use. And it also helps in the consistency of contouring. So uh, as uh, can be seen here in the picture, the, the GTV uh, very clearly can be differentiated from the lung parenchyma. But as you change your window levels, your GTV will change. So you have to make sure that at least uh, your GTV has, uh, when it is surrounded by the lung parenchyma, it has to be delineated on a lung window. When this GTV is close to your mediastinum, you have to toggle between the mediastinum and the lung window. Otherwise, it will be difficult to distinguish this tumor from the mediastinal areas. Uh, so that is what uh, has been, uh, this is again uh, reiterating the same point. And uh, one important thing is that tumors which are extending into the bronchus, you might not be see, able to see it in the mediastinal window. So toggle between the mediastinal and lung window and the mediastinal uh, and the uh, extension of the tumor into the bronchus particularly is better seen on a uh, lung window. So one more thing that is recommended, and it's been studied actually very systematically, that whenever you're delineating, make sure that you have all these three planes. So when you're delineating, keep all these uh, this is the uh, 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 contouring planes that you should be using so that you know as to superiorly and inferiorly what you are including and what you are excluding and you might be including a vessel uh, which if you uh, delineate while um, seeing all the orthogonal planes might be more useful and consistent. Now, coming again to the nodes, uh, this is uh, really tricky and what to include in the GTV this is guidelines by Senan sometime in 2005. What they say is that if it is a PET positive node, include it in the GTV. If it is a PET negative and a, a greater than one centimeter lymph node, that is that there is ambiguity between the CT scan and the PET scan, uh, it is better to include that nodal region. Because whenever there is a diagnostic uncertainty, it, it is better to include uh, that uh, node in the GTV. And uh, what this is, if a node is PET positive, and despite the EBUS being negative, provided you have done a EBUS, uh, it has to be included because the false negative rates of EBUS and US are very high. PET positive nodes should only be excluded, provided either you have a biopsy or you have a very clear cut explanation that the patient has sarcoidosis or 
concurrent tuberculosis or your pet your radiologist suggests that these are symmetrical uh, lymph nodes which look more inflammatory in that case you might exclude this pet positive lymph nodes so one more challenging thing is i told you about um, sequential chemo radiation as to what volumes to use pre chemotherapy or post chemotherapy and the recent guidelines state that uh, that uh, the gtv should be based on the recent ct scan but the pre chemotherapy imaging should always be you try and fuse that imaging and at least in your ctv you include that part of the gtv uh, if it is not included in your regular ctv expansion that is what uh, the guidelines say and oh, for gtv lymph nodes they are very particular even after chemo, after chemotherapy if all the lymph node stations disappear still that lymph node stations have to be included in the gtv lymph nodes when you are doing this kind of a approach so for ctv primary we know for squamous and adenocarcinoma the probability of inclusion of microscopic disease is 95% if you use a 6 mm margin for a squamous and 8 mm ctv margin for the adenocarcinoma and when you give uh, a margin it's a volumetric margin you don't draw on each slice you have uh, obviously all the systems have uh, allow you to give volumetric margins and where there are areas for example bone and all normal tissue barriers that is where you need to exclude those regions a important point about the uh, centrally located lung tumors is what they suggest is if there is a bronchus involvement it is a good idea to take 1 cm of the bronchus within the ctv and this is again based from surgical series wherein if there is a central lung tumor they generally do take a 1 to 1.5 cm margin uh, uh, in the region of the bronchus so for central tumors uh, with the evidence of main bronchus invasion take 10 mm of margin and use 3d tools for generating ctvs and uh, ctv notes another uh, discrepancy is what to contour is it the region the entire region or is it just the lymph node and the uh, trials uh, particularly the 06717 trial which did show a low incidence of uh, uh, isolated nodal failures with the use of uh, elective uh, nodal irradiation with the use of uh, involved nodal radiation did use uh, the entire lymph node level so uh, it is it is again a choice uh, uh, you can uh, because it does not entail increased toxicity when you are using either a margin to the lymph node uh, ctv margin or the entire level uh, as i described earlier so that's option 1 uh, where you, you take the entire level and that is option 2 where you give a margin of about 5 to 8 mm and uh, if it extends into the esophagus particularly you have to make sure that you edit that region uh i spoke about motion management so when do you implement motion management and what the task group guidelines suggest that it should be implemented when uh, the motion is more than 5 mm and when you think that implementation of motion management is going to cause significant normal tissue sparing but keep in mind the motion itself might be less but the reproducibility of these interventions that you use to reduce motion might be more so you have to standardize whatever motion management technique that you are using in your department just uh, don't say that i am using a breath hold or uh, or for example or abdominal compression because it's important to see how reproducible are these methods and uh, what is generally suggested uh, it is better to use motion management when the three dimensional length of motion exceeds 10 mm you might use it for 5 mm but it is generally not going to be cost effective particularly the setting of locally advanced lung cancer and how do you calculate the length so this is the formula so you you take the superior inferior the medial lateral the anterior posterior you square them up and you put them over and that is how you get the length of motion so if this exceeds 10 mm then 
probably some kind of a motion management technique is required. So this is ICRU uh, 62, which basically introduced the concept of ITV. And uh, this basically incorporates the motion of the tumor. And beyond ITV, you have a setup margin to, uh, uh, to get your PTV. There are active methods. Uh, you can use gating. It's not very frequently used uh, anywhere across the world because uh, to get a regular breathing cycle, to be able to give radiation only during a specific phase of re rest respiration is very challenging. Breath hold, commonly used in uh, breast cancer patients, but it is difficult for the lung cancer patients. They have comorbidities, they have large tumors, their ability to hold the breath is, uh, is, uh, is limited. Uh, tracking is one of the techniques. It's more useful for so small tumors wherein you're trying to do SBRT, but for large locally advanced lung tumors uh, might not be that uh, cost effective. Abdominal compression is uh, uh, another method where you uh, compress the abdomen so the breathing is uh, actually uh, uh, dampened and thereby the motion is dampened. Uh, so these are the different active methods, but see the kind of tumors that you get in the clinic are very large, uh, locally advanced, they're fixed to adjacent structures. So the motion itself might not be very large requiring these uh, techniques, particularly in a locally advanced setting. The most common uh, technique that is used is assess the motion on a 4D CT scan and uh, you delineate on all the phases of the CT scan or you delineate on the maximum intensity projection image that you, you delineate the MIP, which incorporates uh, the motion. And that is what gives you a ITV. This is the most commonly used technique. And now people are suggesting using a mid ventilation or mid position. Again, it depends upon whether your vendor, uh, the 4 CT vendor is able to give you this kind of uh, uh, imaging set. Uh, at least uh, at my center, this is not available. So we are using the ITV concept. And uh, just to give you a basic sense of what these different uh, techniques do. So if you have a tumor and uh, the tumor, this is the minimum, maximum inhale and uh, maximum exhale and inhale. And if you give a regular margin, a largest margin with on a free breathing scan, you might actually miss if you are not assessing uh, motion properly. The second concept is the concept of ITV, wherein the entire range of tumor motion is captured and then you give a margin, but certainly the tumor volumes are going to be large. The third concept is basically a gating technique, wherein uh, when the tumor is in a certain position, for example, N exhale, there you, 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 you just treat the tumor there, so you have a small PTV margins. And the last concept is a mid position scan uh, wherein you get a time weighted position mean position of the tumor so this is the geometric position average position and this is a time weighted average position so when you divide the breathing cycle this is the position where the tumor is going to lie for its maximum duration so that's called the time weighted average position and then you give a margin accordingly so these are the different uh, ways of integrating motion. One of the patients where we delineated uh, uh, GTV in different phases, those are the different colors that you see. And uh, we got uh, IGTV by, by combining the GTV uh, phases of the scan. So that's the motion. And you can see how asymmetric it is. You, you, by giving a symmetric margin, uh, you would not be able to uh, capture this kind of uh, motion. And here you see, uh, that's the free breathing scan, but when we delineated in all the different phases of the uh, 4D CT, you see that uh, the, the motion that is captured, how asymmetric it is. Uh, so, so this is how we do at a center. Uh, lastly, coming to the planning target volume, conventionally 10 to 15 centimeters, it's inclusive of the internal margin, that is ITV and a setup margin. It will depend again, all of you know, uh, uh, depend on the assessment of the motion, the method of immobilization and the method of verification techniques that you use are going to determine your setup margin. So whatever technique that you use for assessing tumor motion is going to determine your internal margin. And for setup margin, you have immobilization and verification techniques, which will help you 
uh, get those kind of margins. And uh, this is uh, some guidance from the RTOG paper, which basically suggests that if you have a free breathing with IGRT, without IGRT, these are some kind of uh, the, the, the PTV solutions that uh, they have given for different uh, techniques. Uh, if you're using an ITV-based concept, a five millimeter margin all around uh, seems to be sufficient uh, to take into account a set of errors provided you do daily IGRT. Uh, these are the OARs that you have to keep in mind when you're doing, uh, treating your lung tumors. When hard bilateral lungs, they are bilateral lungs and generally we look at the lung minus PTV. There is debate whether you look into GTV or PTV. Most of them look into lung minus PTV. The plexus, but to the cord is uh, 50 gray we generally accept 45 gray the mean lung dose uh, less than 20 gray v20 uh, uh, that is lung minus ptv less than 35 percent if you're using concurrent taxins it's it's uh, it's better to be safer you can keep it less than 30 percent the mean dose to the esophagus less than 40 gray what's also important is the length of the esophagus that comes in the field preferably keep it to less than uh, 9 to 10 centimeters the other thing is that the 60 gray envelope should not completely encase the esophagus so that's another thing when you are evaluating your plan you should be keeping in mind the maximum dose to the plexus is uh, about 66 gray and for heart uh, after the rtog 061 trial they say that you keep it keep as low as possible uh, but these are the other constraints that are given and basically the end point here that they are looking uh, for the heart is pericarditis uh, thank you for, uh, and i would be happy to take uh, any questions thank you dr sagun it was very comprehensive and uh, you tried to cover all aspect from uh, basic to controversies and uh, I think uh, now it's time to move to question and answer. Still, uh, we are um, uh, missing the post-op and SBRT. Maybe you yeah. require to <laughs> take a second. Maybe I'll take, uh, actually I wanted to take for the lymph node level delineation, but I thought that they should understand the concept when we, they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, take a patient for radical CTRT. Uh, so, yeah yeah it is very important uh, and that's why uh, yeah still uh, everyone is uh, waiting for question and answer session and uh, uh, you can uh, see question and answer in uh, chat box also i or uh, i just read one by one and you uh, first question is asked by dr adya whether uh, if uh, nodes are negative in pet ct so can we treat only primary so uh, this is what at least uh, the guidelines say that if they it is pet negative mm -hmm. and they are not enlarged on a ct scan so then you can possibly treat only the primary but if they are enlarged on a ct scan then there is some degree of ambiguity so it is preferable wherever there is ambiguity it is preferable to take the node yeah if uh, so you have to take both into account the size as well as uh, the the uptake on the pet scan yeah yeah Dr. i think yeah uh, i want to do one announcement next class is on bacco target delineation in bacco alveolar region by dr sapna nandia okay uh, next uh, now you take uh, questions please take questions yeah okay okay thank you thank you dr rasi uh, so uh, the controversy arise if node is negative then may surgeon also just land up into the field and they uh, start for taking case for the surgery so i think it so, is very less likely we get yeah. a node negative patient uh, but yeah it's a uh, equi so, equi yeah. from the surgical viewpoint let me tell you that even if it is a pet negative node yeah. They will always go for some kind of a mediastinal staging workup. Either it is EBUS or uh, 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 this EUS, mm -hmm. or they will go for a uh, mediastinoscopy. Yeah. And 
plus an EUA, if it continues to be negative, they will still go ahead with the mediastinoscopy because the negative predictive value of mediastinoscopy is very high. So, I mean, that kind of ambiguity is there. But if uh, they use combination of EBUS and uh, EUS, then uh, they sometimes they may. Uh, sometimes they may, but uh, I mean, still there is a debate uh, that uh, these uh, they should be still evaluated if they are negative. Still, some of them would go and evaluate with a mediastinoscopy. Right, right. And uh, next question is: uh, Should IMRT be done if no motion management facility is available? This was the question asked by Dr. Gaurav. So it depends. I mean, uh, if you are trying to incorporate uh, the the motion by 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 basically giving larger PTV margins, then uh, possibly you can do. Uh, IMRT. I would not say that uh, don't do IMRT, but some basic form of motion management uh, preferably should be done. Uh, preferably it should be done and uh, uh, if you don't have that kind of facility, maybe at least uh, you can see it on your uh, fluoroscopy and uh, see the tumor uh, motion in the supin direction and try and incorporate it in your PTV. So you have to give largest PTV margins. Yeah, uh, rightly said. If the tumor is small, if you able to take uh, ITV into consideration with uh, reasonable uh, sparing of remaining lung, then you can do it. Then that. you can do it, yeah. yeah. And next question is uh, again related to this. If uh, uh, V20 is higher than 35 percent, then what uh, are the options, whether we uh, can deviate, we can accept uh, higher doses or we switch to reduce the total dose, how you optimize if V20 is higher than 35 percent? So there, there, there are various ways of optimization. So uh, I mean, when you look at these uh, trial groups, they accept uh, V20 uh, uh, up to 37%. So that's the upper limit that they would accept. Mm -hmm. The uh, second thing is like some of them would give uh, sequential uh, chemo radiation so that the size of the tumor decreases and possibly you might see some dosimetric benefit when you replant. The third thing is uh, what's particularly recommended by the VUMC group is to uh, basically uh, try and dampen the motion by using uh, abdominal compression or possibly a breath hold which will decrease your PTV margins and probably you will be able to then uh, uh, v, v20 so these are the three four uh, uh, options that are available to you mm. the 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 extension of this question whether they if not achievable then uh, can we switch to palliative therapy or uh, we can do sequential i think uh, it would be a good idea to first uh, again depends upon a lot of factors it's not just the v20 it it's you have to look into what what are the what are the comorbidities of the patient uh, what is his performance status and then you take these kind of decisions as to whether to just shift to palliative or you would like to go for a sequential kind of approach if he's good performance status right and uh, no comorbidities i would still try a sequential approach but if he, he has poor performance status and a lot of comorbidities, I would just shift it to a palliative reg regimen of 39 and 13 or 13 10. Yeah. If uh, uh, next question is uh, re related to nodal contouring, whether if it negative and but a node is rounded, or, uh, then uh, how you, uh, uh, you include uh, what um, on based on what CT criteria basically they want to ask? So basically, the short axis diameter more than one centimeter presence of uh, necrosis or a conglomerate of lymph nodes. If you have these factors, preferably to overtreat, Pre yeah. preferably, preferably to include these nodes. Okay. Because the chances of finding disease is high. Okay. Uh, if uh, this question is asked by Dr. Asmita, 
if uh, some center is not having 4d ct then they can use a uh, deep inspiratory and end excel ct as a um, so, itv contouring yeah. absolutely so this is one of the recommended in the older papers this was recommended you take a deep inhalation scan and a uh, expiration scan but the problem uh, you have to keep in mind is that uh, i mean it's a too deep and too deep inhale or a too deep exhale so the motion of the tumor might be overrepresented but if you do not have anything this is a possibility that you can uh, take these kind of scans for assessing motion the second thing second scan th uh, the second kind of scanning that has been uh, also uh, uh, used in literature is basically multiple ct scans so you acquire multiple ct scans six or seven uh, ct scans at one go but then you have to be careful that you are exposing the patient to a lot of radiation so that also kind of uh, you know tries to uh, assess the motion uh, uh, in, in the entire breathing cycle but yeah, yes know. deep inspiration and expiration can be done uh, but you have to keep in mind it might be overestimating the motion yeah right please next uh, is the question in metastatic case uh, this is asked by dr salis uh, in limited volume metastatic case if uh, given a new adjuvant if given chemotherapy and responded uh, bony mets all uh, if uh, asking in presence of bony mets if that responded then can this these patient to be taken for consul consolidation radiation therapy or uh, yeah, they are still uh, eligible only for palliative radiation therapy how you um, up, uh, uh, when you recommend consolidation uh, radiation therapy in metastatic scenario so when you look at the metastatic setting you have to quantify whether it is oligomets or it is multiple mets mm -hmm. so for oligomets at least even for a solitary brain metastases there have been studies from the md anderson group wherein uh, patients who present with a solitary brain mets they have received consolidation radiation and their survivals are generally better similarly for uh, for uh, the the oligometastatic groups uh, if it is a, a bone only metastasis uh, you have one or two sites possibly radiation to to the uh, to the primary can be considered but uh, uh, i mean uh, we don't have uh, robust evidence uh, supporting uh, these uh, uh, these uh, uh, recommendations yeah uh, but i think there is only phase 2 uh, trials so phase 2 yeah there is no phase 3 data but uh, yes phase 2 uh, data is available for both uh, non small and small cells in metastatic scenario and uh, next question is asked by dr uh, raja uh, whether all pleural tags are malignant uh, or um, they could be benign whether they all pleural tag uh, is considered as visceral invasion hello the radiologist all pleural tags are not malignant yeah. that all pleural tags are not uh, malignant so if you have a very thin pleural tag which is uh, radiating from the uh, tumor to the pleura uh, as i showed you in the diagram it it is basically inflammation but if you uh, and also if you have a thick pleural tag so you need to discuss with the radiologist and i showed you those features of pleural tags uh, which which tell you that possibly this is omnis so i told i showed you the type 1 type 2 type 3 so basically the type 2 tags are the ones which which are omnis okay i think uh, uh... Uh, there is no more posted question uh, now we can uh, hand over to dr anu dr anu yeah one more question from my side yeah yeah please uh, because, yeah, uh, one thing i want to ask what to, if you have a facility of sbrt and conventional both what would you like to do i didn't get your question dr rashi uh, if you have facility of both sbrt and conventional rt 
So it, uh, see here we are talking about locally advanced lung cancer. So yeah. the indication of SBRT does not hold true for a locally advanced lung cancer. The indications are completely different. So for a stage one uh, lung cancer, that is where SBRT is indicated. So of course you would like to do SBRT in that group. But for a locally advanced lung cancer, uh, it is conventionally fractionated radiotherapy as of now. Yeah, you are right. But uh, as you already have mentioned, uh, there are one of out of four patients are going to recur after some time. Yes. That's why I was thinking uh, there should be some trials. They, they are doing some more dose, planning to give some more dose so that, that we can have local survival, increase our local survival. I think there are a lot of hypofractionation trials yeah. that are going in place and some kind of acceleration. Yeah. I didn't talk about the soccer trial, which has used 55 in 20 uh, with sequential chemotherapy and has shown promising results. Yeah, but then you have to be careful about the volume uh, over there because the volumes that they have are much smaller than what we see over here uh, in the locally advanced setting. Now that's what I want to ask. Not exactly SBRT, but hypofractionation so that we yeah. can give some uh, good result to our patient also. Absolutely. I mean, maybe in future we can uh, do it. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Rasi. I, I not remembering exactly. There is an ongoing trial where they treated uh, the, uh, treating conventional CTRT followed by SBRT boost. There are trials going on uh, in locally advanced. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's still it is an uh, ongoing. Uh, yes, I think uh, still experimental as of now, the current standard is uh, CTRT conventionally fractionated. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Okay. it was an amazing lecture. You know, still 62 participants are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anu, are you here? Dr. Anu, uh, yeah, ma'am is here. Ma is here. <laughs> thank you, Shagun. It was such a nice presentation. And you know, we are like first time in last six classes. Your class was full. And <laughs> still people are waiting to join. So, you know. Define yeah. your class. Yeah. Pleasure. Uh, people are liking these classes. Target deletion by Punita ma'am and all other our uh, colleagues was appreciated very well. Thank you so much for this kind of initiative. It's always a pleasure to teach. Rashi and uh, Anu and Arun, would, we would really like to thank you guys for taking the initiative. It's really beneficial and we really enjoy these classes. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your blessings. Yeah. I think, Dr. Anu, you can give closing remark. Dr. Anu, you, thank you. I think I already did. It was a very, very nice presentation and very informative. And thank you, Shagun. Yeah. And uh, there are lots of people, they are asking for a link. So, Rashi, yeah. you can do the favor. Yeah, yeah. What will I do? Uh, I will re stop recording. There will be a link I will share. In NCG yeah. grid, National Cancer Grid or uh, on my uh, YouTube channel, they can have. Yeah, still if they, anyone missed, uh, not able to find, they can uh, send uh, uh, some uh, request in the WhatsApp. Uh, we will yeah. uh, immediately send a link. And I would also thank to Dr. Arun to be there with us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because being moderator is not a simple job. I can go everywhere, but he has to sit and see all these Aliya. things. Am I right, Dr. Anu? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bye, 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 ma'am. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Oh, good day to all. Thank you. Thank you.